Hello everyone, welcome to SJS classes. Before we begin today's session, let me tell you that if you are on my channel for the first time, please do subscribe to my channel. And if you find this video lesson to be very useful, please share this to your friends. It's an extract from the book by Henry Reid that we will look into today. The book is titled The Meaning of Art. I'm sure you would like to know who Herbert Reed is if you haven't come across this name earlier. So here is an introduction to Herbert Reed. Sir Herbert Edward Reed was an English art historian, poet, literary critic and philosopher. He was born on December 4, 1893 at Yorkshire in England. His first book, Collected Poems, was published in 1926. Some of his early notable works are The Innocent Eye, 1933, The Contrary Experiences, 1963, and Naked Warriors, 1919. After World War I, Reed worked in the ceramics department at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London for a period beginning in the year 1922 and ending in 1931, which was an experience that initiated his career in the visual arts. He later wrote many critical works on art, like Art Now, which came out in 1933 and was revised a couple of times later on, Art and Industry, 1934, Art and Society, 1936, Education Through Art, which is one of his most popular works, 1943, and The Philosophy of Modern Art, 1952. As we read his biography, we understand that he was influenced by a host of writers and critics of his period like Wordsworth, Pound, Mary Ann Moore, William Carlos Williams, T.S. Eliot, etc. We also understand that he regularly contributed to T.S. Eliot's journal, Criterion. He even had a strong friendship with the Indian author Mulkaraj Anand, which Anand writes about in his conversations, uh, which in his memoir, memoir titled Conversations in Bloomsbury, which came out in 1981. He was also instrumental in founding the Institute of Contemporary Arts, of which he has been the president. He died on June 12, 1968 in London. So that was a brief biography of the author. Now here is something about the book that we are about to discuss today. The book is titled The Meaning of Art. It was published in 1931 and since its first appearance in 1931, Reed's introduction to the understanding of art has established itself as a classic of its kind. It provides a basis for the appreciation of paintings, sculpture and art objects of all periods by defining the elements that went into their making. The book also provides a concise survey of the evolution of art from cave drawings to modern paintings of its times and also summarizes the essence of art movements such as Gothic, Baroque, Impressionism, Expressionism, Surrealism, Tachism, etc. We don't have to learn the entire book. Rather, I wouldn't be discussing the entire work. It's just a portion of it that uh, I will read. To be precise, from page number 17 to 14. In these pages, what we find is an attempted uh, definition of art, an elaboration of art and beauty and various components and or elements that uh, constitute what you call as art. So these are some of the uh, concepts that you will find as we read along. I would like to remind you that I have incorporated only the important points from the extract in this video lesson. I have given a link in the description box. If you would like to read the extract as such, 
you can use the link that I have given in the description box. All right, so let's start reading the work and try to interpret the different concepts that Henry Reed has mentioned in this particular work. I will discuss the first 10 paragraphs in this video lesson and the remaining 15 would be discussed in the second part of this video series. So the very first paragraph is what he calls as a definition of art or rather it's from this particular paragraph that we will get something like a definition of art. The symbol word art is most usually associated with those arts which we can distinguish as plastic. Plastic here refers to any art form which involves modeling or molding in three dimensions. So normally the word art is used to address the plastic or visual art forms. But Reed says that Properly speaking, it should include the arts of literature and music. So Herbert Reed is of the opinion that when you say arts, it is not just molding or modeling or painting or architecture alone. The concept art must also include areas like music and literature. It was Schopenhauer who was a German philosopher, who first said that all arts aspire to the condition of music. So by stating this, Herbert tried to augment or substantiate his claim that art must also include areas like literature and music. He called Schopenhauer to emphasize this connection or inclusion. He continues, the architect must express himself in buildings. The poet must use words which are bandied, which means clever. And the painter usually expresses himself by the representation of the visible world. Only the composer of music is perfectly free to create a work of art out of his own consciousness and with no other aim than to please. So what Reed want, reads, reads wants to convey here is that for all other art, it calls for an intrusion made by external elements. Be it the architect or the poet or a painter, you have external elements, factors influencing his creation. But it's perhaps only the art of music that comes from within an artist. It is only music that remains untouched by external factors during its creation. So that is what he tries to point out here. All artists have the same intention, the desire to please, and art is most simply and most usually defined as an attempt to create pleasing forms. So finally, he concludes this particular topic or this paragraph by giving us some sort of a definition of art. He says that art is an attempt to create pleasing forms. Be it painting or poetry or music or architecture, all arts attempt uh, or all arts are rather attempts from artists to create pleasing forms. So let me again remind you, I have incorporated only the important points. You might find uh, missing links in between. That's because I have taken out only the important sentences, sentences from the text. We will move on to the second paragraph. It can be called as the sense of beauty. Any general theory of art must begin with this supposition that man responds to the shape and surface and mass of things present to his senses and that certain arrangements in the proportion of the shape and surface and mass of things result in a pleasurable sensation whilst the lack of such arrangement leads to indifference or even to positive discomfort and revulsion. So Reed brings in this supposition that, that art is man's response to certain aspects of things which are present before him. He states that man responds to things like the shape of a thing or surface or appearance of a thing and even mass or what is within a particular thing. It is by an arrangement or rearrangement of these aspects that he sees before him that he creates a pleasurable sensation or revulsion. Revulsion means an intense, uh, intense aversion. 
and all these are created in the spectator or audience so it's basically by an arrangement or rearrangement of these aspects like surface or appearance shape of a thing uh, mass or what is within that thing that he creates an intention intense aversion or a pleasurable sensation in the spectators or audience the sense of pleasurable relations is the sense of beauty the opposite sense is a sense of ugliness so this is where he distinguishes between that which is beautiful and that which is ugly he says that uh, for read actually the evocation of pleasurable sensations is an indicator of beauty in art and vice versa as an indicator of ugliness in art moving on to the third paragraph this is where uh, you find a or something like a definition of beauty be being given by Herbert Reed. There are at least a dozen current definitions of beauty, but the merely physical one I have already given. And the definition that he has already given is beauty is a unity of formal relations among our sense perceptions. So, uh, the merely physical one I have already given is the only essential one and from this basis we can build up a theory of art which is as inclusive as any theory of art need be. So according to Reed, beauty lies in the unity of various aspects that constitute art. He then goes on to say that perhaps this particular ideology is the only essential one that we need and from this foundation or basis you can build any number of theories of art which would include any other theories that have been already expounded on art during various ages in history. Moving on to the fourth paragraph, it's titled Distinction Between Art and Beauty. Most of our misconceptions of art arise from a lack of consistency in the use of the words art and beauty. We always assume that all that is beautiful is art or that all art is beautiful, that what is not beautiful is not art and that ugliness is the negation of art. It might seem to be quite confusing but I'm sure if you fragment the sentences then you will be able to understand it better. So what Reed says is, is that uh, we have been using the words art and beauty uh, inconsistently. The ideas that come into our mind have been inconsistent in a way. The concept of beauty established by the Greeks and continued by the classical tradition in Europe has fluctuated. The meaning has uh, fluctuated. It has changed into something else. Idealization may have been what was beautiful for them, but today it's not just idealization of things we see around us that conveys the concept of beauty. So earlier for the Greeks perhaps idealization might have been a thing that gave beauty to an art. But these days it's not just idealization that can be called as beautiful in art. We have the tendency to assume that what is beautiful is art and that all arts are beautiful, but it might not be so. It is not what, that what is not beautiful is art and when something is ugly, it is not art. So this is what, what, ha, what has been consistent, inconsistent as far as uh, Reed sees it. Now for us, what uh, is beautiful is art and what is not beautiful or what is ugly is not art. So there has been inconsistencies with respect to this attitude that uh, history has been offering art. Let's move on to the next paragraph. This is where we read or we look at art as a product of intuition. Beauty, as I have already said, is generally and most simply defined as that which gives pleasure. It has now been superseded in the main by a theory of aesthetics derived from Benedetto Croce. Benedetto Croce is an Italian philosopher, historian and politician. And though Croce's theory has met with a flood of criticism, its general tenet that art is perfectly defined when simply defined as intuition has proved to be much more illuminating than any previous theory. 
So read in this paragraph, Croce quotes the Italian philosopher Croce, who states that art is simply intuition or instinctive knowledge. This ideology was crit criticized by many, but Reid states that this particular theory by Croce was enlightening and illuminating than any other previous theories. Let's continue reading. The difficulty has been to apply a theory depending on such vague themes as intuition. But the point to note immediately is that this elaborate and inclusive theory of the arts gets on very well without the word beauty. So what makes this theory by Croce is uh, so different or unique is that this theory does not define art in terms of beauty, but in terms of intuition, instinctive knowledge. Moving on, paragraph number six. Uh, the title to describe this paragraph is the classical idea of beauty. Let's read. The concept of beauty is indeed of limited historical significance. It arose in ancient Greece and was the offspring of a particular philosophy of life. So the idea of beauty or the concept of beauty, uh, it's, not, it's not something that has been of great significance in the recent years. It was discussed even during the classical period. Typical examples of classical art are the Apollo Belvedere and and the Aphrodite of Milos. I'd like uh, you to see both this, you know, uh, sculpture. Uh, this is Apollo Belvedere, and uh, it is a celebrated marble sculpture from classical antiquity. It's located in the octagonal court of the Museo Pio Clementino in the Vatican Museums, and it was probably you know, created between 117 and 138 AD. And what you see in the sculpture is a marble statue of 88 inches of a beardless athletic Apollo. The surface of the statue seems very smooth and Apollo's face shows a neutral expression. He steps forward a bit with his right leg and throws back his cloak over his left shoulder to show his fully naked body. He looks to his left and has his left arm stretched out to support his cloak. So this is the description of the image that you see or the sculpture that you see on the screen and this and this particular sculpture is called as Apollo Belvedere. Well, let's move on to the second example that has been quoted by Reed. It's called Aphrodite of Milos. The Aphrodite of Milos is better known as Venus de Milo. is one of the better known of the many ancient Greek sculptures. It is believed to be from the Hellenistic period. The statue was found by a farmer on a small Greek island in 1820. The statue is generally accepted to be a representation of Aphrodite, who is the goddess of love and beauty. Now, you might be confused as to from where the name uh, Venus came. The name Venus comes from the goddess Roman counterpart, that is Venus. So Aphrodite is Greek and Venus is Roman. The statue is displayed at the Louvre Museum, which is the world's largest art museum and a historical monument in Paris, France. So these are the two examples that uh, Reid quotes here. And he says that typical examples of classical art are the Apollo Belvedere and the Aphrodite of Milos. Uh, these are perfect examples or ideal type of humanity or these you know, sculptures, they give, give us ideal types of humanity, uh, perfectly formed, perfectly proportioned, noble and serene, and in one word, beautiful. This type of beauty was inherited by Rome and revived at the Renaissance. So what Reed is attempting to convey here is, the, is that the concept of beauty as far as the classical antiquity or period is concerned, you know, and he even gives us representative examples that he suggested that are perfectly formed, perfectly proportioned, noble and serene in appearance. Uh, and these are the kind of artworks which uh, in, word can, in one word can be defined as beautiful. This concept of beauty lasted till the Renaissance period. A Greek Aphrodite, 
a Byzantine Madonna and a savage idol from the New Guinea or the Ivory Coast cannot one and all belong to this classical concept of beauty. So what the classical period as so as beauty may not be applied to certain you know uh, artworks which might you know belong to some other geographical area or to, to some other period of time. The last one at least if words are to have any precise meaning, we must confess to be unbeautiful or ugly. And yet, whether beautiful or ugly, all these objects may be legitimately described as work of art. So what Reed does here is, he quotes a few other paintings and idols which were created later down in the history and states that if you attempt to understand beautiful in such artworks in terms of the you know, concept that were prevalent during the classical antiquity or the concept of beauty which was prevalent during the classical period, then you will miserable fail as the concept of beauty changed as we go further down the years in history. Paragraph number seven, art is not uniform. That is what he tries to convey through this particular paragraph. Art, we must admit, is not the expression in plastic. I explained to you this term at the very outset of the, 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 the extract. Uh, it means you know, modeled or sculpted artworks. Art, we must admit, is not the expression in plastic form of any one particular ideal. It is the expression of any ideal that the artist can realize in plastic form. So he uh, Reed says that to see art in a restrictive sense is not right. Uh, it is not the representation of an ideal thing or concept. Anything can be portrayed ideally by an artist. Moving on to paragraph number eight, it's titled Art and Aesthetics. The abstract sense of beauty, the abstract sense of beauty means, you know, that sense which exists only in the mind. The abstract sense of beauty is merely the elementary basis. Elementary basis means the most, the most basic aspect. So the abstract sense of beauty is merely the elementary basis of the artistic creativity. The exponents of this activity are living men and their activity is subject to all the cross currents of life. And then Reed goes on to describe the three stages involved in the process of artistic creation. He states that there are three stages. First, the mere perception of material qualities like colors, sounds, gestures and many more complex and undefined physical reactions. The second stage is the arrangement of such perceptions into pleasing shapes and patterns. The aesthetic sense may be said to end with these two processes. But there may be a third stage which comes when such an arrangement of perceptions is made to correspond with a previously existing state of emotion or feeling. Then we say that the emotion or feeling is given expression. So Reed here kind of theorizes the process of artistic creation by bringing in a methodology or process through which art is created. In the first stage, you have a perception regarding the material things that contribute towards your art. There might be things like colors, sounds, gestures, physical responses. And then in the second stage, you as an artist arrange all these perceptions into pleasing shapes and patterns, which is art. A third stage develops when the artistic work that you have created forms a medium through which you have expressed your previously existing emotions. So these are the three stages of you know, artistic creation as far as uh, Reed is concerned. Let's continue reading. According to Croce, I quoted Croce earlier. Like I said earlier, he is an Italian philosopher and historian. According to Croce, expression is the basic creative act in, the, in all the arts. The work of art comes into existence with the act of incarnation, that is to say, at the moment the artist finds the words or other media to express his emotions or state of mind. So art, uh, as Reid puts it or quoting Croce, can basically be expression expression of an artist's emotion or state of mind which the artist expresses through words of any suitable words or any other suitable media 
uh, we get yet another attempted definition of art here and to yield this purpose he quotes Croce who believed that expression is the basic creative art act in all the arts. However, Reed points out that Croce does not make a clear distinction between expression that we call beautiful and expression we call ugly. A formless or informal expression may or may not deserve to be called a work of art. So, uh, both Reed and Croce says that art is basically expression, but Reed points out that Croce does not give us a clear distinction between what we call uh, good in art and what we call as ugly, perhaps in or out of art. Moving on to the ninth paragraph, which can be titled as Form and Expression. The permanent element in mankind that corresponds to the element of form in art is man's aesthetic sensibility. So it is uh, man's aesthetic sensibility or his sensibility towards or about beauty that has corresponded towards the element of form in art. Sensibility as such we may assume static. So our sensibility you know, it remains changed. It, it remains unchanged. What is variable is the interpretation which man gives to the forms of art which are said to be expressive when they correspond to his immediate feelings. So Reid says that such sensibility or the sensibility that we have towards art does not change. It remains static. But what varies are the interpretations that we give to various forms of art which might or might not correspond to a person's immediate feelings. So it's not the sensibility that changes but the interpretation that we give to various arts. Now let's uh, now see how Reed sees expression in art. He says that expression is a very ambiguous word, something that cannot be clearly deciphered, something which we cannot clearly understand. It is used to denote natural emotional reactions, but the very discipline or restraint by which the artist achieves form is itself a mode of expression. So what he means is that it's not just the emotional reactions that constitute expression in art. The very method by which he gives a particular form to his art can also be said to constitute expression. So the methodology adopted to create a form, to give a particular form to the art can also contribute towards expression. Form, though it can be analyzed into intellectual terms like measure, balance, rhythm and harmony, is really intuitive in origin. It is not in the actual practice of artist and intellectual product. It is rather emotion directed and defined and when we describe art as the will to inform, we are not imagining an exclusively intellectual activity but rather an exclusively intuitive one. So finally Reed concludes this part by stating that though form may be described in terms uh, of aspects like measure, balance, rhythm, which are basically products of man's intellect, it is basically intuitive in origin. Which means that form is created as part of man's instinctive knowledge about something. It's not an intellectual activity as such, but it uh, is a product of our instinctive knowledge. So moving on to the last paragraph that I will discuss today. It's titled The Golden Section. Since the early days of Greek philosophy, men have tried to find in art a geometrical law, for if art is harmony and harmony is the due observance of proportions, it seems reasonable to assume that these proportions are fixed. So read uh, the, in the beginning of this paragraph says that for the Greek men of letters, the main component in art was harmony or unity between parts and this harmony or unity was brought about by observing proportion between various components that constitute art and they wanted these proportions to be fixed as any alterations could destroy the harmony in that particular work of art. Let's read further. 
The geometrical proportion known as the golden section has for centuries been regarded as such a key to the mysteries of art and so universal is its application not only in art but also in nature that it has at times been treated with religious veneration. So this geometrical proportion that we talked about earlier or the geometrical proportion that talks about harmony in art through maintaining proportion was termed as the golden section and this was much considered in the production of art down the history. There is considerable literature on the subject and from about the middle of the last century it begins to be treated with great seriousness. A German writer, Seising, tried to prove that the golden section is the key to all morphology. Morphology is a study of the forms of things. So a German writer, Seising, he tried to prove that the golden section is the key to all morphology, both in nature and in art. Gustav Theodor Fechner, a German experimental psychologist, philosopher and physicist who was the founder of experimental aesthetics, whose principal works were published in the 70s, made it one of the foremost objects of his research. So we have people like Seising, who was a German writer, and Gustav Theodor Fechner, another German experimental psychologist and philosopher. They even made uh, intensive research on this particular idea called the golden section. All right. So uh, since then, practically every work on aesthetics includes some consideration of the problem. So Reed points out that the idea of golden section did not end with the classical scholars. It was followed and practiced and even researched later on by philosophers and writers uh, of the 19th century like uh, the German uh, psychologist Adolf Seising and the German experimental psychologist uh, Gustav Theodor Fechner. And Reed continues to cite examples that uh, followed this particular ideology of the golden section. The pyramids of Egypt have been explained by it and the Gothic Cathedral. Gothic Cathedral refers to religious buildings that were created in Europe during the mid 12th century and at the beginning of uh, 16th century. And these constructions, these architectural marvels can be explained or interpreted using the golden section. The relation of the length of transept, you know, he even gives some of the technical ideas that incorporate that were incorporated uh, into the construction of these um, Gothic cathedrals. Uh, Reed says, um, the relation of the length of transept, and trans transept is the structure forming the transverse part of a cruciform church. Cruciform church is a church that is constructed in the shape of a cross. So the relation of the length of transept to nave, nave is the central area of a church, of column to arch, of spire to tower. Spire and tower have the meaning. A spire is refers to a tall tower. So from the spire to tower and so on, all have can be explained using the golden section. The proportion is also used very frequently in pictorial art. The relation of the space above the skyline to the space below, of foreground to background, and equally of various lateral divisions follow the golden section. The paintings of Piero della Francesca, who was an Italian painter of the early Renaissance, are extreme examples of geometric organization. So this is where uh, the, the, uh, the discussions regarding the golden section comes to an end. So it was something which was practiced by the classical uh, thinkers and uh, artists. Uh, and it was also later on handed down to various other uh, artists which we confront uh, uh, down the history. So this is where we will, uh, rather I will end the discussion uh, in this particular video lesson. Thank you so much for patiently listening to me. Please do look for the part two of this video series, which I will post soon on my channel. Thank you so much. I'll see you in another video lesson.